to another edition of Who's Number One. I'm Trey Wingo. ESPN Classic is picking a hoops team. Actually, we're picking the equivalent of four. Our 20 players include a couple of big men from a certain Southern California-based dynasty and a center who led his Northern California-based team to back-to-back -back national championships. And from Ohio, one who was a magician with his mind and one who was a magician with the ball. Here, then, are the 20 greatest college basketball players of all time. Bill Bradley, everybody's All-America choice. Bill Bradley, to me, was the consummate basketball player in terms of getting the most out of the physical part of his game. He could shoot it, he could pass it, and before he got the ball, the play was made. Bill does everything in basketball smoothly, easily, and superbly well. Bill Bradley was a technician in terms of what he wanted to do. One of the great shot makers of his time and one of the great shot makers of all time in NCAA history. Now watch Bradley number 42. Beautiful hook shot. They called him Dollar Bill. With the game on the line and the winning shot to be made, Bill Bradley was money. He was an Ivy Leaguer who understood the sport's subtleties. A two-time All-American at Princeton, he averaged 30 points, and in the 1965 NCAA Final Four consolation game, lit up Wichita State for 58. I have asked people since that day, can I get a film of this game? Because I was unconscious that night. Everything I threw up went in. He had a presence as a college player that even players who were probably more talented than him later didn't have. Number 19. Tim Duncan is a unique player because of his mindset when he steps on the court. He's never rattled. Um, you can never really throw him off. He doesn't dazzle anybody with the things that he does. But he can score low, he can score facing, he's a great passer, very unselfish. The most fundamentally sound college basketball player since Bill Walton just did everything right. There was a sense of serenity in Tim Duncan's game, seamless and unhurried, all the dots connected. At Wake Forest, he was a two-time All-American and the first player in NCAA history with more than 1,500 points, 1,000 rebounds, 400 blocks, and 200 assists. He had, in short, four ways to beat you. Anybody that doesn't understand the brilliance of Tim Duncan's play uh, isn't really a, a, a basketball person. You're just a fan looking for titillation, but to perform in a proper way, in a fundamental way, that makes everybody else around you better, that's pretty special. The thing about Tom Gold is that he did every phase of the game of basketball. Tom was ahead of his time. He could play the center position, he could play the forward position, he could play the guard position. He could handle it, he could shoot it, he could make a play, he could guard, he was a great defender. Tom Gola had great court vision. He truly understood what it took to, to run a show. Uh, have the ball at a crucial time so that either he would have the choice of taking the shot himself or, or making sure that the right person got it. A three-time All-American, the 6'6 Tom Gola was a tireless retriever and a solid scorer. Only one of two players with more than 2,000 points and 2,000 rebounds. He led LaSalle to two straight NCAA finals, including the 1954 National Championship. His career total of 2,201 rebounds remains the NCAA record. Tom Gola may have been the greatest individual player pound for pound in the era in which he played in the history of college basketball. If you even say today, who are the greatest players ever to come out of Philadelphia? Obviously first is Will Chamberlain and Tom Gold will be right there. Number 717. I thought George was one of the best or greatest competitors that I ever coached. George worked as hard as any man that ever played for me. He made himself into a great basketball player. When he was playing, they called the big guys goons. And they were just big guys that were taller than anybody else, stronger than anybody else. 
stood under the basket and put the ball in the basket. That's all they did. George Mikan, I don't think, ever took a shot where he was more than three steps away from the basket. He kept opposing teams busy defending their basket, most often without success. Gangling, bespectacled, and immovable, the 6'10 George Mikan was college basketball's first dominant big man. A three-time All-American, he led DePaul to the NIT title in 1945, and the next season, as player of the year, was the nation's top scorer with 23 points a game. The thing about him that I remember the most is not just his size, but he was like an oak tree. You couldn't push him out. He just stood there. And even today's players, as much as they push, they couldn't push George Mike another. He was too big and too strong. Michael Jordan came to us not highly recruited compared to what people are today, but uh, one that improved every year. He grew, and he also would listen every practice and work so hard. Out of the open. Michael Jordan. This guy hated to lose anything. I mean, he had to be the first guy dressed. He had to be the first guy in the shower. He had to be the first guy out of the locker room. He had to be the first guy that's sitting down at a training table to eat. The fact that Michael Jordan is not in the top one of college basketball players is because of the system in which he played. The line went that the only person who could stop Michael Jordan was Dean Smith. But in three seasons at North Carolina under Smith, MJ flourished. He was player of the year as a junior, and as a freshman nailed the game-winning jump shot from the wing that delivered a national championship. 20 seconds to go. They Jimmy got Black something set up. Here's Jordan. Yep, he's letting it go. Good from 15 feet. I think if you followed North Carolina the second and third year of Jordan, and you saw his progression, and you saw some of the games he played, it was not a surprise that he became this player of the age. 15. He was a take charge guy from the day he walked on the court. He was never concerned with points or assists or whatever. All he wanted was the bottom line. That was all that Irvin ever cared about was winning. Magic was a great competitor and a guy that really had fun playing the game. I think that's the thing of all the things that I think about uh, in competing against Magic was the fact that Magic always was having fun. He enjoyed it. Teams were winning, but they weren't winning with style. And when we played, we played with some flair. That's what I remember about Michigan State. The fact that we got a chance to change college basketball in a sense. And we did it with style and flair. Oh, 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 oh. Magic was the name, and Magic indeed was his game. He makes our list despite only playing two years at Michigan State. The multi-talented Irvin Johnson was an All-American in 1979 when he led the Spartans to their first national title and revolutionized the game. Nobody ever seen a guy play guard that size before. He's able to post you up, play the game, and his just unbelievable court vision to make teammates better. All of us in coaching had to deal with that over the next few years after Magic. You know, you'd get the 6'8 guy that had no business being out on the court, and they were all thinking they were going to be the next Magic Johnson. He was so unique in that position. As a college basketball player, he was unbelievable. You rarely get a player with that type of imagination, have a player that fits that imagination. 14, number 14. 14. He gave you leadership, he gave you emotion, he gave you so many intangibles. Christian's fire heated our building to the highest level, and I love that. Christian was the most confident player, uh, borderline arrogant player that I played with, and because of that, he was willing to make those kind of plays for us that we needed. Back to Lightning, dribble, takes a shot at the buzzer. Ah! He didn't really care what people thought of him. He did things his way and was very successful at it. Iceberg cool with a smirk and the willingness to take the big shot 
Christian Leitner led Duke to four straight Final Four appearances and back-to-back -back national titles in 91 and 92. His turnaround jumper against Kentucky in the 92 regional finals remains one of the most memorable game-winning buckets. Leitner catches, comes down, dribbles, shoots, scores! Christian Leitner has hit the bucket at the bunker! Christian Leitner, when the lights were on, when, when nationally, it was nationally televised basketball games, he came to play, and he always put up good numbers. Number 13. Ralph Sampson was kind of seeing the future. I remember the first time I saw him play on television. And he was so big and so skilled. You weren't used to seeing people that big, that skilled. Ralph was mobile, and he was extremely long. And around the basket, you just couldn't stop him. There's a guy who's 7'4", who was able to run the court like a guard. He could handle the ball. He could pass. He could do it all. He had the whole package. That package included three-time Player of the Year and the only two-time winner of the Wooden Award. Ralph Sampson averaged 17 points and 11 rebounds in his four seasons. He's one of those players that 10 years from now, 15 years from now, people talk about Ralph Sampson. Like, Ralph Sampson in his time was, you know, the best player in college basketball. And he changed the game. Number 12. Elvin Hayes is one of those guys that slips through the cracks, the quickest release of a turnaround jumper. His size and mobility, uh, just unerring accuracy. He could get a lot of points from different angles. He could explode to the basket. Underrated and understated, Elvin Hayes averaged 31 points and 17 boards in his three-year career in Houston. His biggest performance came in January of 1968 in the Astrodome, when he fired in 39 in the Cougars' upset of an injured Lou Alcindor and number one UCLA, snapping the Bruins' 47-game winning streak. Elvin Hayes is putting on a one-man show. I looked at it as, I have an opportunity to shine brighter and to lift my star up a little higher against probably one of the greatest basketball players to ever play in college basketball. And so that night was my chance and my opportunity, and I took it. Number 44, Elvin Hayes, the Houston hero. In an era of great scores, he was one of the absolute best. What a great, great college player. And really, the University of Houston, you had never heard of them before Elvin Hayes. 11, 11 number 11. Jerry never had two bad games in a row. If Jerry West had had a bad game the night before, you better not be the next guy coming into town. Because he's going to tear your head off. He was best uh, when things were rough. I mean, when the, when the going was tough and his team was behind, or he was in a tough situation. That's generally when he arose to the occasion. One of the things I always remember is they had this big gold and blue carpet that led from their bench right out to the jump ball circle. And when they introduced the home team, they would run out on this carpet and they had the lights dim. Of course, they always introduced Jerry West last. He would come out and they'd say, and the greatest mountaineer of them all, number 44 from Cabin Creek, West Virginia, Jerry West. They might as well said the number 44 of Jesus Christ from heaven. Shy and quiet, nicknamed Zeke from Cabin Creek, Jerry West put his beloved West Virginia on the basketball map, averaging 25 points and 13 boards in his career. A two-time All-American, West led the Mountaineers to the 1959 NCAA title game as a junior. The mechanics and everything were there, but they hadn't been polished, and he taught himself how to play the game. He's one of those guys that first guy practice, last guy to leave. And that, that's Jerry West. His work ethic was unreal. We lived uh, probably 100 yards from the field house, and uh, everybody would have games for three or four hours, and we'd go on home, and uh, he'd be there practicing on the shooting. Two or three hours later, here he comes. He'd just finished up. I truly love to compete. Uh, sitting in the locker room, even then, you know, water dripping off your hands, the electricity going through your body. Just going out there and letting those emotions try to be controlled and, and uh, to play in an environment which would allow you to win.
Welcome back to Who's Number One, an ESPN Classics ranking of the 20 greatest college basketball players of all time. So many worthy hoopsters from which to choose. Here are just a few that missed our list. Can't handle it. Calvin Murphy, the little big man. High scoring Hank Lassetti, inventor of the running one hander. And John Wooden. Yes, that John Wooden. Three time All American as a player at Purdue. With that bit of business out of the way, back to the countdown. Can't handle it. Number 10. 10. 10. Look at Ewing. Backward stop. Amazing. Patrick could hurt you in many ways. First of all, he could block the shot. Second, he could rebound. Third, he was an intimidator. I mean, guys were afraid to go in there. It was so clear in college that he was the heir apparent to Bill Russell as that dominant defensive force who could alter a game without scoring a point. Got it to McClain. Oh, that walked away by Ewing. He could cover up my mistakes, Michael Jackson's mistakes. Someone beat us off the dribble. I mean, he's blocking a shot here, blocking a shot there, and then plus at the same time running the length of the floor, scoring. His career numbers at Georgetown were modest, 15 points, 9 boards. But it was his role of the great eraser that made three-time All-American Patrick Ewing so dominant. He helped the Hoyas win the national title in 84 and was the symbol of the team that was feared by others. Two! Send it in, Patrick! We were the Raiders of college basketball. Um, but it was fun. Everybody hated us and we loved kicking everybody's butt. When he went to Georgetown, a Big East school, that was the most symbolic message to the rest of the basketball world that this was a serious league and this league was going to change basketball in the East. They were going to be a major player. If you think of the Big East uh, in, in the early 80s, you really have to think Patrick Ewing. To make three championship games in four years and to almost win three of them, I mean, that's, that's really a sensational record to have. There's no question he was the best player ever in the Big Ten. Nobody ever has been able to do the things that he did. He could go in the post, he could rebound. He played the game so easily, you know, he was very graceful, he ran easily, he had uh, an incredible timing around the basket for rebounds and taps. Plus, he was a very good shooter. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone with hands as good as, as Jerry from the standpoint of uh, being able to catch the ball, deflect the ball, tap the ball, cushion the ball, whatever he wanted to do. I mean, it just seemed like a sponge with absorbing water. Jerry Lucas would develop total recall and a photographic memory. But at Ohio State, it seemed he already could foretell the future. Averaging 24 points and 17 boards, he appeared to see the play before it unfolded. He was a three-time All-American and led the Buckeyes to three straight title games, winning it all in 1960. Top all-round performer is the Buckeyes' Jerry Lucas. Ohio State takes the crown with a runaway 75-55 victory. And Jerry Lucas cuts away the net as a trophy of the first Big Ten NCAA championship since 1953. Here's an individual that uh, had a record of 78 and 6 with a national championship, shot over 60% from the field. And I don't know if you could match that anywhere in the annals of college basketball. David Thompson did things nobody had ever seen before. He had that wow factor. Passing to Walton, blocked by David Thompson. The 17 years I coached in the ACC, David Thompson was the toughest guy to stop. Thompson up in here. What a jumper. I thought he was the greatest basketball player in college basketball because he kind of revolutionized the game. He had about a 40 two 44-inch vertical leaps so he can compete inside with the big guys, had a feathery touch outside, so he had a strong perimeter game. Pass it up, he hits it. Dan Bonner told one of the great stories of all time about stealing a ball against North Carolina State when he played for Virginia, and he could hear David Thompson coming from behind, so he gave a little head fake just before he went up for the layup, and the fake worked. He went over him, 
and kicked Dan in the back of the head. At 6'5", David Thompson lived above the rim where the air is rare, and he took his North Carolina State teammates up there with him. He averaged 27 points and eight boards, was a three-time All-American, and in 1974, helped win the national championship, toppling the UCLA dynasty in the Final Four. Winning the NCAA title, I got more enjoyment out of that than anything. Setting a goal at the beginning of the year, working hard to accomplish that goal, and just being the best at something was something that really I'm very proud of. Number seven, seven, seven. Larry Bird was one of the most fascinating college basketball players I ever saw play. Carl Nix from Chicago played with Larry Bird on his team. Carl Nix would come back in the summer and say, you would not believe this kind of playing ball with you. Oh, that's a He knew what was going to happen before it happened. Our game plan was to get the ball in his hands as much as possible, and, and he made good things happen. Oh, oh, what a shot. Does he ever miss? I thought he had the best hands of any kid I'd ever seen. Oh, what a catch. What a catch. And he had a mind that I thought was like, like a camera, um, clicking a picture and passing on what to do. He could create the play on the move, coming off the board. He could make the shot. He could play inside. He could play outside very effectively. And he had that competitive confidence that he was the one that was going to determine the outcome of the game. He was called the Hick from French Lick. Then when they saw him play with an all-around brilliance and a snarling intensity, they said it with respect. Larry Bird was a folk hero at Indiana State, averaging 30 points and 13 boards and taking the Sycamores to the brink of the 1979 National Championship. I think that uh, we were linked from then on, Larry Bird and myself. I got a chance to watch a guy who played just like myself. I wanted to win. I wanted to do whatever it took, whether it was diving on a loose ball or whatever. I just play the game the way I feel everyone should play. I played hard. Excitement, enthusiasm, greatness. That was Pete Maravich. He did things on the court that nobody had ever done before. But he didn't do them to really show off. He did them because he gave him an advantage over the opposition. Pete Maravich was a did you see that entertainer, conjuring passes that logic and gravity said were impossible, and taking and making shots that geometry said you just couldn't do. I went to the Georgia LSU game in Athens, and he was incredible. I mean, it was like watching the, the Globetrotters. This guy could handle the ball and had such charisma that uh, I think the Georgia fans were clapping more and excited about him than they were their own basketball team. On a three-on-two break, he would take the ball and act like he was going to pass to this guy over here, and actually he would bring the ball and wrap it around his back and flip his wrist and hit the guy over here. Pistol Pete, the perfect nickname for Pete Maravich, was a quick-draw genius who could rat-tat-tat you for 44 points, which just happened to be his career average at LSU. That's an NCAA record, one of many he still holds at a time when there was no three-point line, by the way. Pete Maravich was probably, pound for pound, the greatest college basketball player ever. Number five. five. Will Chamberlain's reputation coming out of high school was that he was so big and so overwhelming that nobody could ever deal with him on a basketball court. There wasn't anybody else that big. He just couldn't figure out what to do. He was just caught in a, in a waiting for the game to be over. Will Chamberlain was the redwood in the forest, as strong as the oak, as supple as the willow. Playing only two seasons at Kansas before joining the Harlem Globetrotters, he was an All-American for both years, averaging 30 points and 18 rebounds. Well, you know, how do you stop the guy? There's only one way to do it with an ax. I mean, really, I think we can stop that guy. And uh, turn around, jump shot, finger roll, jam. 
Wilt was very skinny at that time, but he was maybe the greatest athlete of all the centers that's ever played the game because he broad jumped, he high jumped, he ran the 400 meters, and just an unbelievable athlete. That's Wilt the Stilt in the pivot. He doesn't miss. In 1957, Chamberlain and Kansas lost the national championship game to North Carolina in triple overtime, but he wanted to be known as more than Goliath. He wanted you to know that he was a basketball player because he worked at the game. There was something to him other than a guy that could jump out of the building and was a guy stronger than the earth and a guy that was as quick and as fast as he was of his time and his era. Here's the six foot five inch sensation who's causing opposing coaches to have nightmares. When you talk about great all around college basketball players in the history of the NCAA, you have to mention Oscar Robertson. He had no weakness. He could pass, he could shoot, he could defend, he could rebound. Oscar was the first really big guard who had all the attributes of a little man. He was quick, he was smart, he was adroit, he was strong, he could leap. So you were looking at a guy who could do everything that a six foot guy could do, but he was six foot five and weighed 210, 215. He had an extraordinary advantage in most college guards. His mental aspect of the game was always light years ahead of anybody that ever played the game. Watch number 12 assist on another two pointer that gives the Bearcats a 76 64 lead. While Oscar Robertson introduced the triple-double as a pro, he rehearsed it during his three seasons at Cincinnati. 34 points, 15 boards, and seven assists per game. He was the first sophomore named Player of the Year. When you play basketball, and if you're a player, you know, a real true player, you don't worry about things like that. The game comes to you, you take advantage of the situation when you're in the game. I never was conscious of anything I did at the university. The scoring, or the assists, or the rebounds. He was the epitome of the uh, basketball player that flowed into what was the objective of the game, which was to get the easiest shot, the closest to the basket, as often as possible. And he had the uncanny ability to make an average player on his team good. The Big O scored 56 in a regional game in 58, and the next two seasons led Cincinnati to the Final Four. The least surprise at his brilliance were those who played with him. He was a standout from the time we practiced as a freshman, played freshman basketball, to the time we graduated in college. He amazed me every time he stepped on the court. No one was going to stop Oscar, and no one ever did. Three. Three. There's Bill Russell, San Francisco sensational All-American center. When I was working for Time and Sports Illustrated, we constantly sent memos back to New York saying you should think of putting this guy from San Francisco, you, Bill Russell, on the cover. They'd come back and say, yeah, but we got the box score last night, he got six points. And we'd say, yeah, but did you notice the other team only got 42? Russell blocks his shot. With Bill Russell patrolling the pivot, opponent's shots were swallowed up and turned into breakaways. He was so adept at shot blocking that the NCAA widened the lane. Bill Russell is basketball's all-time most valuable player. I think he elevated the defensive end of the floor beyond anybody's imagination. When he first started blocking shots, he'd knock it out of bounds. But he got it to such an art, his block would be the first pass for a fast break. He had such incredible timing. He was a great jumper. He had very long arms. He always said that it wasn't blocking shots, it was a threat of it. He didn't block every shot that he could. He picked his spots and he made him think about it. It became Bill's team when he was blocking everything and his conversation with us. Don't worry about it, take care of it. You just keep playing hard and, uh, and you back me up and I'll, and I'll take care of your guy. One of five players to post a career average of 20 points and 20 boards, Russell led the Dons to 55 straight wins and back-to-back -back national title championships in 55 and 56. His intuitiveness was what impressed others. His intelligence was not only related to angles on the court and knowledge of the game and understanding of uh, the techniques of rebounding and shot blocking and team dynamics, but also because he had an incredible mental understanding of the game. The West Coast was kind of behind the curve in college basketball after World War II. 
Bill Russell kind of changed it to where the sport just really kind of flourished after that. And I think, he, in essence, he really kind of set the table for UCLA. If I went back over all of the years of the NCAA, the guy that I would choose to pick as standing alone in NCAA tournament competition without any reservation would be Bill Russell. Two. As a college player, he was incomparable. He had a presence on the court uh, that, that was so intimidating and engulfing. This cloud hung over the gym wherever he was. Bill was a leader. He was a vocal leader uh, on the team as a freshman. And that's what you really don't see. The greatness came from Bill being that dominant leader. Walton goes up. Walton hits it. He was Wild Bill Walton, the red-headed rebel in an era of the flower child. And his energy and passion fueled the UCLA juggernaut. He was both defender and choreographer in the pivot, leading the Bruins to the national titles in 72 and 73, and was instrumental in extending their winning streak to an NCAA record 88. Bill Walton changed everything inside. He's a whole complexity of the game because he was so defensive-minded. You knew Bill was back there to save you on your defense. I could put so much pressure on people that they would get by me and they would run into Bill Walton. He did it at both ends. He rebounded, he passed, he scored. He would take rebounds off the rim so fast on this shot that I couldn't tell even watching the film later whether the ball was still over the rim or not. You had the sense, even though he was following uh, Lou, Kareem, uh, that he was eight feet tall. I mean, his ability to catapult himself straight up. He didn't lean, he, he jumped straight and was able to deliver the ball on a break better than anyone I've ever seen. In the 1973 title game, Walton made 21 of 22 shots and route to a 44-point performance that awed almost everyone but the man himself. I get a lot of special credit and recognition for the night in 1973 when I set a number of records in the championship game. But that was far from my best game. It was just a game where it all came together. Memphis State had begun to crumble under the relentless attack of the Bruins and Bill Walton. If you would take all the fundamentals you would want in a center or post player and judge him, I think Bill Walton, healthy, would rate higher than any player that's ever played. Welcome back to Who's Number One and the Greatest College Basketball Players of All Time. Here's the list so far. Bill Bradley. Tim Duncan. Tom Gola. George Michael. Michael Jordan. Magic Johnson. Christian Lake. Ralph Sampson. Elvin Hayes. Jerry West. Patrick Ewing. Jerry Lucas. David Thompson. Larry Bird. Pete Maravich. Wilt Chamberlain. Oscar Robertson. Bill Russell. Bill Walton. So who is it? Who stands alone?
who is the greatest college basketball player of all time? All right, just pretend you're shooting a free throw now. Deep breath, exhale, release. One, one. Growing up as a youngster in San Diego, California, Lou Alcindor, then playing for the UCLA Bruins, was everybody's idol. The way he carried himself with such pride and such dignity and the joy that he showed, the enthusiasm that he played with on the basketball court, and the level of excellence. He became known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but in 1965, he was Lou Alcindor, and he was leading the UCLA freshman team to an intra-squad victory over the mighty Bruins varsity. The losers were slack-jawed. It was a very humbling experience, to say the least. It was one of the few times, and maybe the only time that I can think of, when I saw Wooden speechless for a moment. He really didn't know what to say to us. We got them into the habit of losing. They had a little tough season that next season, and uh, it was a funny experience. They were number one in the nation, but number two on campus. After losing, all I could think of is, the season's going to be a long season, but we get a chance to play with him the following year. When the teenager from New York was eligible at last to play with the varsity in December of 1966, he debuted with 56 points. Now that's a school record. Averaging 26 points and 16 boards, he led UCLA to three national championships and a record of 88 and two. He was so dominating that the NCAA banned dunking after his sophomore season. I told him, you're going to improve your hook shot. You're going to improve your little short uh, jump shots off the board. I like you to turn it on. And you're going to be better at all these because you're going to have to work hard on them, and you will. He wanted to learn and to be the best, and I think the dunk rule was the best thing that ever happened to him. Because if you think about it, if he'd have just been able to dunk it every time, he probably never would have developed those areas of his game. The greatest winner in college basketball history, Lou Alcindor lost two games in his three years. UCLA was already good when he got there. They had won the two national titles prior to his freshman year, but after he got there, they became the most dominant program in college basketball history. Time now for our second guessers to take their shots and assess our list. Did we dunk it or did we miss completely? What's the verdict? All right, Scoop, let's get into the list. No problem. Right off the bat, I have an issue with Pistol Pete Mar Maravich being what? number six. I'm sorry. Higher, right? I know you went to college in Louisiana, <laughs> but, but there's got... no way what? he is number six, the sixth greatest college player of all time. Yes, sir, easily. He never led his team to the NCAA tournament in three years. He only led them to one postseason tournament, and that was the NIT, where they finished third. Pistol, I know he averaged 44, but he shot 44% from the floor. That was enough. The whole offense was, was based, he had, he had the whole <laughs> offense was based around him. And that's because his nobody father was else the coach. got to set exactly, it up that way. Exactly. If my father was the coach, I'm taking 40 shots a game too. Come on. Cool, but you still got to execute. You he, still got to put the ball in the basket. He's in the top 20. He's in the top nah, 20, man, and PG. his flashiness was great. He should but be there's high. no he way should. he's number this six. This is the best players. Not about winning. Not it's the best. But the best players win. When at they least, got things at around least it, when they got some, substance to some around degree, it. degree, at least to some degree, no. They didn't have substance because nobody else got to touch the rock, man. Come on, you know that. All right, look, all right, I'm, okay, okay. I'm not going to argue that. I see I'm going to lose this argument. But look, I'll give you Pete. All right. If you give me Will Chamberlain, drop it. Because if you talk about Pete shooting 44% from the field, Will Chamberlain at seven feet, the average person guarding him at 6'6", six, six, shot, what, 47% from the field? And you talk about not winning? Okay. He did not win any championship years in Kansas either. Now, you look at all the other great players on this list, Lou Alcindor, Bill Walton, Oscar Robinson, Jerry West, Larry Burke. Look at their field goal percentage. Will shoot 47? No, he got to come right, to MP. So, so where, you, where's I Will going? Roughly, where's Will going? He's going below top 10. I know you had issues, too, with Ralph Sampson. Number 13. Oh, overrated. I think he's one of the most overrated. He's definitely, to me, one of the most overrated players on this list. Not because I'm looking at his NBA career, but you look at the time in which he played, to me, his numbers were okay, but he didn't dominate the game the way he should have. And you look, he played at era Patrick Ewing. Patrick Ewing on this list is at number at number 10. Justifiably so. Up, but yeah, justifiably so. But you look, he played at the same time Ralph Sampson did, but Patrick dominated. In college, Michael Jordan 
I don't know if he was the 16th best college player of all time. Now, maybe Dean held him back. We know Dean, you know, yeah. his system. But still, I mean, Michael, you know, when he, he won his title as a freshman, but they had James Worthy and Sam Perkins. Sam Perkins and, and Black running the point. Yeah. You know, so the, the he, had, he had a legitimate squad on that team. And I think Michael's whole persona gets magnified in this. I've done some shows uh, where that team is considered the greatest team ever yeah. strictly because he's on. I'm like, Michael was not. <laughs> Michael Jordan, yep. he wasn't that Michael Jordan. I know you want to make a point about Tim Duncan. Though. Yeah, I mean, Tim Duncan, I, I see it like Michael. I mean, uh, in my opinion, the greatest power forward of all time. But no in doubt. college, I mean, I look at, especially when you're a seven footer, you have to lead your team to some victories. He never got him past the Elite Eight. So, yeah, I mean, I, Tim Duncan, I think the one argument, he's one of the 10 players to ever have 2,000 points and 1,500 right. rebounds. But he didn't, you know, the impact he had, it just wasn't that dominant. I, I can't put him in the top 20, probably. I'm going to say this. I may be wrong about this, but I think Tim benefits from the doubt that he stayed in college during an era where everybody was jumping in. The That's fact true. that he stayed, he gained the respect of a lot of people to look for him. Like, here's a cat who was the best player in college basketball as a junior, but he decided yep. to stay. So we're going to give him, you know, that benefit of the doubt and stick him on a list like this is one of the greatest stuff because he bucked the system and he did what wasn't, you know, um, was done at the time. We can move Bird up. Bird needs to go up there. I think Bird should go up under Oscar Robinson in number five. Bird, and maybe that's because I had luxury of being in Chicago and watching him play his college career the last two years at Indiana State with the point guard Carl Nix. But, you know, Carl would come to the crib and tell us stories about Larry Bird, and then we got to see him play. To me, he goes right behind Oscar Robinson. Because you look at that team he led to the, to the finals against Michigan State. I mean, your boy Carl Nix was solid. That's but they, it. yeah, they that's didn't it. have anything at all, and that, that was magnificent. And Magic's a guy who would have been higher. Yeah. If he stayed, you know, obviously past the two years. Year. And Greg Kelso played along with him. Yeah, you yeah. Know, and he made Magic look <laughs> happy. So. <laughs> All right, that's good. All right, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks, Trey. And thanks to you, Scoop and Chris. Now let's look at how you, the fans, voted on our ESPN.com Sports Nation poll. Who did you think was the greatest college basketball player ever? Number five, Bill Walton. Number four, Larry Bird. Number three, Lou Alcindor. Number two, Pete Maravich. And number one, David Thompson. So that's it for this edition of Who's Number One. I'm Trey Wingo, and thanks for joining us for ESPN Classics ranking of the 20 greatest college basketball players of all time. Rest assured, we'll be back to continue our countdown of the teams, the athletes, and the events that have shaped our world of sports. Until then, let the debating begin. <laughs>